Spicer from New Jersey. These are some of my artworks. And I'm here today to ask you the question. Sorry. Are we living in the matrix? Is the universe just one big simulation? What if everything we thought we knew was nothing more than virtual reality? I ask these questions now for several reasons that are more relevant to us than ever before. And not just because the fourth Matrix movie was recently released in theaters, but because in some sense, we might be living in the Matrix in more ways than just one. The social system we are born into treats us like numbers on a screen. The dimension of digital information that our lives, our lives rely on increasingly seeps into every facet of our reality. And the secrets of the universe are rapidly revealing themselves, only to show us that the whole of existence is nothing more than various states of energy conforming to a series of clearly defined physical laws, much like a computer program operating by a set of source codes. So it bears repeating, are we truly living in the matrix? And why are you here with me, wondering the same question? Let me tell you why you're here. You're here because you know something. What you know you can't explain, but you feel it. You felt it your entire life. But there's something wrong with you. You don't know what it is, okay. but it's there. Okay. It's like a splinter in your mind. Drop you bad. It is this feeling that has brought you to me. Do you know what I'm talking about? Matrix. Do you want to know what it is? So what is the Matrix? It's more than just a science fiction movie made in 1999. Since the movie's release more than 20 years ago, the Matrix itself has become a metaphor for a variety of ideas in our darkly modern world, some of which I mentioned earlier. The Matrix movies popularized a range of phrases that are now a part of our everyday vocabulary. From escaping the Matrix and taking the red pill, the following white rabbit lore. The first movie alone made many things mainstream that were once much more obscure, solidifying a set of concepts that have always existed in one form or another, but were never tied together in a way that were quite as impactful to popular culture. Things such as oppress oppressive social constructs, suffocating technological developments, and illusionary worlds. <coughs> These are what the Matrix is made out of, a coalescence of concepts like nothing else. But while the Matrix is to many the ultimate amalgamation of these ideas, it is founded on earlier thoughts and beliefs throughout history that exist far beyond the realm of just blockbuster cinema. From science and science fiction, to religion and philosophy, even meditation and the psychedelic experience, there are many reasons why The Matrix might be more than just a movie. The Matrix is everywhere. It is all around us. Even now, in this very room, you can see it when you look out your window, or when you turn on your television. You can feel it when you go to work. When you go to church, when you pay your taxes, it is the world that has been pulled over your eyes to blind you from the truth. What truth? That you are a slave, Neo. Like everyone else, you were born into bondage, born into a prison that you cannot smell or taste. prison for your mind, an artificial structure designed to ensnare your senses, a simulated reality. Living in the matrix, or living in a simulated reality, was once the subject of pure fantasy, but now it is a notion that is seriously considered by some of the smartest people on the planet, from Elon Musk and Lex Friedman to George Hotz, and even the late Stephen Hawking. 
What makes them believe in such an outlandish idea? Maybe it comes from predictions of the future of technology. Back in 1965, American engineer and businessman Gordon Moore once remarked that the number of transistors in a dense integrated circuit doubles about once every year, an observation that would later become known as Moore's Law. Revised in 1975 to a doubling of every two years, this prediction has held ever since, and it underpins the modern era's rapid technological development. From calculators the size of a house to supercomputers the size of your hand, with this doubling of transistors also comes a doubling in computational power and the exponential increase in our ability to program what we could never program before. One of the best examples of this exponential rise in complexity is in the realm of video games. In the early 70s, the video game company Atari released the first commercially successful video game in history, Pong a totally virtual activity that completely took the world by storm, that consisted of nothing more than a handful of pixels on a small screen. This was the apex of gaming at the time. Only 30 years later, Blizzard Entertainment released World of Warcraft, the massively multiplier online role-playing game that immersed its players in simulated realities, so compelling that it often superseded their ordinary lives. WoW was responsible for relationships so real that it resulted in actual marriages. It became such a negative factor in existing relationships that it ended other marriages. And many parents were so drawn into the virtual world of Warcraft that they neglected their own children and family members in favor of imaginary characters. Every year, video games get more advanced. More of them are made, more people play them, and people play them more often. Handheld electronics take our video games wherever we want to go. Augmented reality places the world of the video game into the real one, and the rise of fully immersive virtual reality video games is drawing ever closer on the horizon. Now, when some video games have graphics so detailed that they are nearly indistinguishable from reality, it raises an important question. What is the difference between virtual realities and physical ones, if the two truly do become indistinguishable. Right around the time, the same time as the release of World of Warcraft, and just a few years after the conclusion of the Matrix trilogy, one person tried to answer this question through philosophy. Nick Bostrom, in his now famous paper titled, Are You Living in a Computer Simulation? From this paper, a trilemma called the simulation argument was born which supposes that one of three equally possible, valid possibilities is true. Number one, the number of advanced civilizations in the universe that reach the capability of creating simulated universes before going extinct is very close to zero. Number two, the number of advanced civilizations in the universe that reach the capability of, created, of creating simulated realities before going extinct and are interested in doing so is also very close to zero. Or possibility number three, the number of advanced civilizations in the universe that have reached the capability of creating simulated realities before going extinct are interested in doing so and, and are interested in doing so is in fact very close to one. In which case, there are likely so many more simulated realities in existence and there are real ones, that we are also more likely to live in a simulated reality than we are to live in a real one. Let's think about this again. Based on pure probability alone, we are more likely to live in a simulated reality than we are to live in a real one. According to this theory, it's simulations all the way down. But is that the honest truth? Is living in the matrix simply a probabilistic inevitability? And are we really ready to take that red pill? Unfortunately, no one can be told what the matrix is. Okay. Mm. You have to see it for yourself. Yes. This is your last chance. 
After this, there is no turning back. You take the blue pill. The story ends. You wake up in your bed and believe whatever you want. You take the red pill. You stay in Wonderland. And I show you how deep the rabbit hole is. So let's find out just how deep this rabbit hole goes. For some of the more skeptical ones out there, it's easy to think that talk like this, of living in the matrix, is only a product of our most modern times. But simulation theory has a rich history that goes back quite a bit further, with many examples predating the internet, and some of them even predating computers themselves. In the mid-1980s, science fiction writer William Gibson published his seminal cyberpunk novel, Neuromancer, an early inspiration for the Matrix movie, which also featured a virtual reality data space named the Matrix. In the late 1970s, science fiction writer Philip K. Dick publicly declared to a live audience that the universe was actually an advanced computer program, that multiple realities existed simultaneously, and that the only clue to these realities existing was when something inside of the universe was changed, an early example of glitches in the matrix. In the early 1970s, philosopher Gilbert Harmon proposed his idea of the brain in a vat, in which a disembodied brain could be tricked into having a conscious experience if a supercomputer gave enough electrical impulses to simulate the stimuli of the physical world. Of course, every one of these concepts came about during the digital age. But the idea of simulated realities and parting the veil that separates them from the real world has existed long before the advent of computers. Living in the matrix, imprisoned inside of a program, having virtual experiences from within a bat. These are only the most modern interpretations of an age-old concept. Throughout human history, we have always suspected that reality as we knew it wasn't quite real. However, our notions of the true nature of reality were always related to the most relevant thing at the time. Today, that thing is the computer. But for several hundreds of years before simulation theory, starting in the Enlightenment period of the late, 19th, of the late 1600s, many deists believed in the idea of the clockwork universe when the most advanced example of technology at that time was a mechanical clock, and Isaac Newton's mechanistic view of physical laws became the gospel of science across the world. Earlier in the same century, the French philosopher René Descartes and founder of Cartesianism imagined the hypothetical existence of an evil demon with the power to present him with an illusory world that appeared to be indistinguishable from Sounds familiar, doesn't it? Even earlier, in the fourth century BC, the Greek philosopher Plato created his historic allegory, comparing our limited perceptions of the world to shadows on the walls of a cave, pale reflections of a reality so bright and so overwhelming that its rays of light would blind us if we saw the truth. Plato's teacher Socrates was paraphrased as saying, the only thing I know is that I know nothing. And another Greek philosopher, Gorgias, recorded solipsism, the idea that the true nature of the world is completely unknowable, that none of our perceptions are reliable, and that the only thing we can ever be sure of existing is our own minds. In the same century as the ancient Greeks, the Chinese philosopher Zhuangzi wrote a story wondering whether he was a man who once dreamed about being a butterfly or a butterfly who once dreamed about being a man. In the religion of Hinduism, a concept known as Maya describes our physical experience as a dreamlike state of illusory appearances that conceal us the true nature of an underlying spiritual reality which is absolute and unchanging. Buddhist philosophy sees the world as a transitory plane of reality called samsara in which physical things are nothing but empty projections, 
Our individual senses of self are merely hallucinations experienced by a universal consciousness. And every incarnation of that consciousness must undergo a continual process of reincarnation until it escapes the cycle of dharma and reaches the state of enlightenment known as nirvana. In the first century AD, the enigmatic religion of Christian Gnosticism developed the idea that a malevolent artificial god created the material realm in order to make humanity ignorant of the true reality from which it came and prevent its ultimate ascension to the state of gnosis or divine knowledge. And even in the contemporary Christianity that we know today, our transient lives on earth are really only tests of how worthy we are of entering the true and eternal kingdom of heaven. We in the world we inhabit are both imitations made in the image of a so-called superior original, all of the accordance to a divine plan simulated entities in a simulated reality operating on a grand program and designed by a supreme being. This is the comic book. It's our loading program. We can load anything from clothing to equipment, weapons, training simulators, So maybe we are living in a dream world. But if so, then what is the real world? Wherever we are in time and space, whether it's the modern age or the ancient one, human beings have only suspected that reality isn't really real, and living in the matrix is just the latest version of this age-old idea. Of course, simulation theory is just as interesting as a science fiction concept, as it is a religious philosophy. But could it also be a coherent scientific theory? Many of those proposing this perspective of reality are also the greatest minds of our generation. In fact, throughout the whole of human history, the story of scientific discovery has always been defined by bold thinkers whose ideas were ahead of their time, people who made us question what we thought we knew about the world, and whose own personal revelations about reality completely rewrote our shared understanding of the universe. While simulation theory at this point is purely speculation. Sometimes the science is simply slow to catch up to the intuition that was always there from the start. Returning to the ages of antiquity, some ancient philosophers proposed concepts that would only become confirmed to us thousands of years later. Before the scientific method was even invented, the ancient Greeks once again understood instinctively that there must be some kind of organizing principle behind the physical world, and many saw such things as sacred geometry, the five platonic solids, and Plato's realm of the ideas as the underlying rules for reality. It was only thousands of years later, in the 1600s, that Newton's careful observations of mechanical interactions helped us to realize that everything in nature truly could be explained by mathematical equations. From the Greeks to the Chinese and everyone in between, countless cultures around the world describe the vast complexity of matter in the world as nothing more than various combinations of basic materials called elements. 
And while the four or five classical elements that those early philosophers defined in their day were primitive notions compared to the hundred or more chemicals that we know now, it wasn't until the late 1700s that the first modern list of chemical elements was compiled. Likewise, the idea that all physical objects were comprised of tiny fundamental particles known as atoms was actually developed back in the fifth century BC by the Greek philosophers once again. For almost two millennia, this idea went untested until the early 1800s when the first modern interpretation of atomic theory was put forward. If these early intuitions about reality form the foundations of future scientific theories, then maybe simulation theory, or living in the matrix, is just another insight waiting for the evidence to confirm its validity. But then again, not everything we know about reality is exactly intuitive either. In fact, much of the scientific discovery in human history is also defined by enormous paradigm shifts, which often overturn thousands of years of conventional knowledge and turn our initial intuitions completely upside down. We live in a world of microscopic structures so minuscule and macroscopic systems so massive that we can't even see them with our own eyes alone. We swim in a sea of invisible electromagnetic radiation all around us with frequencies so far above and so far below the visible spectrum of light, the most are completely intangible to our physical bodies. And while our physical bodies do appear to be solid, most of the spaces inside of the atomic particles that make them up are empty. The illusion of their solidity is only created by the repulsive forces of their electrons. And all matter is merely energy condensed to a slow vibration. General, general relativity shows that our experience of space-time is actually subjective. Quantum mechanics shows that the behavior of subatomic particles defies traditional expectations. String theory surmises that the universe operates with at least 10 dimensions and is actually comprised of vibrating strings. And the holographic principle proposes that the universe is nothing more than a two-dimensional hologram encoded with information and projected into three dimensions. Many mathematicians believe that mathematics is not just a way of describing the universe, but the, the universe itself is mathematics, a mathematical con construct comprised at its lower, lowest layers by pure numerical equations whose interactions build in complexity until they manifest the physical plane of reality that we ourselves inhabit. Some scientists even claim to have discovered self-correcting error codes hiding inside the equations of theoretical physics. And if the laws of physics can be called a kind of programming language, then maybe the speed of light is a sort of processing power. Particles are like polygons in 3D modeling, and the Planck length the tiniest measurable distance in space is like a pixel. But these, states, these statements raise yet another question. If the universe is a program, then who, what, or where is the programmer? Human beings have wrestled with the idea of a creator for our entire history. And while increased technological development has often led people to believe in more atheistic ideologies that pit science against religion, simulation theory might just validate both of them. Maybe we are living in a matrix, and maybe that matrix was created by a superior being, whatever that is. But that creator doesn't have to be some evil AI bent on world domination and the total control of humanity. It could just as, be, it could just as easily be an alien child playing a galactic game of The Sims, mm -hmm. and we could just as easily be the characters inside of that game. Or as some spiritual practices believe, we ourselves might each be separate incarnations of the same creator or divine being, living an infinite amount of simulated experiences in mortal human lives. Whatever the case, ordinary people around the world are breaking out of the matrix every day and realizing the greater truths of reality 
in their own unique personal ways. Whether that comes in the form of the ascended states of mind reached by practitioners of transcendental meditation, the extra-dimensional fractal geometric spaces observed by psychedelic users, or the gradual global 5D spiritual awakening purported by many New Age mystics. Many out there are starting to realize that something about our reality is not quite right or even real. And there might be even more to this universe than what the mainstream believes. So what do you think? Are we living in the matrix? Is the universe just one big simulation? What if everything we thought we knew was nothing more than virtual reality? If you have your own thoughts about living in the matrix, then please feel free to share with us now in the last few minutes of the panel. And for more artwork, art shows, podcasts, and panels just like this one about simulation theory, the matrix, and more, please follow my accounts and support. Thank you. So, does anyone have any questions or comments, thoughts, or ideas? Are we doing a discussion on our own opinions about all of this in existence? Sure, we have time. Sweet, all right. Uh, one second. Turn it down. <laughs> I have to text her. Okay. Um, all right. So, <clears throat> my thinking. Yeah, feel free. All right. I mean, yeah, we, so, okay, yeah. All right, so there are two universes, right? And there is the physical world and there is the medical world. And they're actually like, on the level that we can't understand, two different types of reality. The mm -hmm. physical operates by rules because they're physical structures. It's all math. Like it makes sense you know, like when you know, sort of like physical way. Sure. Um, then the metaphysical world operates on um, a different level, just pure creation, destruction, anything that can possibly happen. Mm -hmm. There are no rules to what can and can't happen. It's just existence. Because of that, Nothing can last. Nothing can actually exist there. And then, if you want to say like consciousness is that medical physical world, where it's into the physical world, um, kind of like the whole idea of we are the universe observing itself. And sure. We are like another universe observing the universe. Um, that's that's my thinking right now. That's what's in my head. Yeah, I think that makes that makes sense on some levels. So, what you think is that the physical reality um, is that itself has rules like inherently attached to it. And then there is the some other metaphysical reality, which is just like a dreamlike world. Yeah. So, but yeah, that's interesting. Yeah. Uh, personally, I sort of think I believe in the idea of two realities, but I see it more as the physical world, like you mentioned. But then the metaphysical world behind it is the one informing the physical world as a sort of like programming language. So there, you know, there might be a sort of different approach to what you're thinking, but it's similar. That that is. Sort of like uh, you know what we see on the screen right now versus the programming behind. The program can be anything, yeah. but the screen you know it has a very it's it is what it is. You know it, it can't happen unless the programming happens first. So you would say that in your idea, um, the programming has like complete control over what actually happens. Like that's it. Not necessarily on a, like a day to day basis. Like you can just you know change something in the programming and, and boom, you're the color purple or something. But well, that's a good question. I mean, uh, in the in the idea of the clockwork universe, right, in like the 1600s, people thought that maybe God or the creator, sort of like a clock, created it and then set it in motion, so that there was no direct interference in the clockwork universe, but that the origin was through some, you know, creation or simulation. It's just running. Okay, so like, like just like to put it out there, I got married on Halloween by January. My husband was diagnosed with cancer and oh, wow. died within six months. Like 
We never found out what it was. Like it was like really, really bizarre. And I was 27 years old when we died. I'm so, like, sorry. That's crazy. crazy, right? Like yeah. why would that happen to me? I'm also like a survivor of like a bunch of like other really crazy stories that have happened to me, and yet I'm still here when I shouldn't be. And I married this guy, and like he was like an awesome human being. And I'm sitting here, and I'm listening to you, and I'm looking at you, and what's really crazy is you sound like him. Oh, really? I'm That's not weird. even fucking around. So like we had these conversations before about whether or not like anything matters. Yeah. And like whether or not like we're real, and like sitting here like this even being on the radar like. It's just, I don't believe in coincidences. Like, I believe everyone sits on my couch for a reason, too. Because, again, like, as a therapist, like, who's sitting there? Why are we connected? Why are you telling me your story? Well, Why am I here to see it? Right. So yeah, that's it's just, like, really, like, again, like, I just feel like, again, like, when we say, I talk to people in session, too, about, like, time, right? Like, right now it's 713. What does that really mean? It doesn't mean anything. It's just a way for us to gauge like our day. So it doesn't have exactly. a meaning. Yeah, it's just a construct. I mean, the space time is a construct. It's gotta be, it's, it's right. not really real. Yeah. This space time thing that we exist in is perceived. Right. So, I'm Drop sure. very feel. Yeah. Um, sure. So this kind of has to do with consciousness and like relation to the nature. So like, let's say we just, we all die. Right. And then, so we've been dead for let's say three days. And then we get uploaded to the matrix. Is this the same self, in your opinion, of who we were, or is this a, con a different consciousness of the same being, but the experience is now in a new? Being? That's a great question. Of yourself, who exactly. Yeah. It's, it's, yeah. Are you I, a new person every time you wake up, or is it yeah. the content you pick up again, which is yeah? Right. I was just, I was just wondering what your opinion. I guess. That's yeah. tough. It could get uh, nerdier. I mean, anyone who's watched Star Trek has thought maybe uh, you know when someone gets beamed up their particles are disassembled and then reassembled into another space. Do, do they have the continuity of consciousness too? Yes. Or are they being like destroyed completely only to be recreated thinking that they have that continuity? But the original, you know, could have been just uh, splattered in smithereens. It's, it's, it's a tough question. Quantum physics getting to the point that it seems like this is science getting back to a place that the mystics have been talking about for, you know, ages. Yeah, that's, I, that's, that's so, I think that's one of the most interesting facets of science now is that for a really long time we tried to stray away from religion and spirituality because we needed to clarify you know, what was real, what, what was proven to work mathematically. And we went, we, we got so far, I feel, like, I feel like, like the 2000s or late 90s was like the peak of just not believing in anything. And then gradually, you know, we realized through quantum mechanics that the world is a little more slippery than we thought it was. People come up with ideas like the holographic universe, you know. We, we Yeah, we still don't have an answer for what exactly it is and, and how it operates. Yeah, that's, you know, there's a concept called the, the morphogenic field, I think. And it's this idea that on a subconscious level, and anyone correct me if you think I'm wrong, because, you know, I'm kind of just coming up with stuff on the fly here. But I'm pretty sure the morphogenic field is uh, supposed to be this underlying field of a sort of collective consciousness. And if you've ever heard of the 100th monkey syndrome, I think that's what it's called. It's, it's been observed in certain cases that um, once a certain 
a certain number of members of a population learn something, then that, that learning happens rapidly throughout the rest of the population with no, with no real reason as to why that would be. As Even if, at a distance, I, I believe was the case. Where right, there's no connection. People getting the same idea, like the phrase thoughts are in the air. Right, it's the universal mind. Right, it's just coming from the ether somewhere. It comes from but right, but if we have manifestation, then we can influence reality then. Well, maybe we can. Maybe we can. Sure. Well, I think that's really interesting, both what you said and what, what the person in the corner said in terms of ultimately, does it matter whether or not we're living in a simulated reality because we're still bound by the very same notions that we have to face every single day. And, you know, you mentioned you mentioned meditation and sort of like, is there pattern recognition involved in that? And you mentioned as well people as a therapist on your couch finding patterns involved in that you believe is perhaps more of like a fake or a fatalistic, excuse me, uh, perspective of, okay, I believe that everybody comes here for a reason. But ultimately, I, I feel like what that doesn't feed into and what I think is really unfortunate, and I, I almost wish that Nick Bostrom never did make that, that, that piece that he did that became so famous because I think it delineates from the really essential question, which is what you mentioned, which is whether or not we're living the simulated reality now, it doesn't really matter, but the question that I am most fascinated in is can we ourselves in whatever reality that we may or may not currently be living in construct our own version of a simulated reality that would be more utopian than mm. what we're living in right now? Well, I think that's what tech, I don't know if it'll necessarily be utopian, because I, I think a lot of our early, our, our, our lot of our, a lot of our early visions in science fiction, uh, you know, it, I feel like it cycles between horror and utopia, like, like the '40s and '50s, right? Like, it was, oh, monsters from space, or like giant ants from Mars, or something. And then, as we learned a bit more about reality, we had visions of like a, a bright future in space. You had Star Trek from the '60s. You had um, like space operas like Flash Gordon. Uh, Barbarella is like a sexy future. Um, and then, you know, you start to get more dystopian again in, like the 70s are weird and psychedelic, and then the 80s, you get stuff like Blade Runner, which is totally dystopian. So it's hard to tell whether our future, which seems like it's becoming more dystopian by the day, you know, whether we'll actually end up there, or maybe the real world will become so dystopian that the only the only solace we have is to create the utopian simulated world, like as a sort of escape. Can I ask you, what fascinated you in particular mm -hmm. about this to want to make a lot of this? Um, a lot of things. I think just being, I tried to draw from a lot of subjects for this, and I think you, when you read about a lot of subjects, you can see that there are commonalities between them that might be pointing to some universal truth between them. Um, if you've ever done psychedelics too, then that's <laughs> that leads you to that. some interesting, uh, interesting directions. Who here would ever do psychedelics? I, I have no <laughs> idea. As psychedelics, <laughs> presently, right now. Well, and yeah. like I mentioned, things like meditation too, yeah. you know, are, are are different, separate ways of reaching similar conclusions. And I think there might be a lot of different parts of reality that are pointing to this direction. And that's, that's the beauty of time moving forward is that, you know, some person might do psychedelics and think, you know, they might see DMT elves, if you've ever, if you know what that is. <laughs> or they might meditate and start like, you know, reaching a state of Zen or astral project. Uh, and you might have people like Nick Bostrom or even Elon Musk who just imagine uploading their consciousness to the cloud. All these different completely separate directions, but they're all converging at this idea of a simulated reality, yeah. which I think is a really cool thing to bring people together in a weird way. Yeah. We can yeah. all talk about it from our different experiences I was, that we're doing I'm now. so thrilled, I thought you did such a wonderful job, and I'm so thrilled to see this here, because I, I, I generally ascribe to the, the, the idea that it could be possible that we could build our own simulated reality. And I, I love The Matrix, it's one of my favorite film franchises, but I think it depicts simulated reality in obviously a very dystopian way. It does, in a very limited way. Right, yeah. I, I mean, I think you have to give it its credit, because before that, 
you might have people who are really into philosophy and history who might learn about uh, like, you know, the Rene Descartes or Isaac Newton's views of the mechanistic world, yeah. but that kind of brought it together in a way that had an impact. It was fun, and I think that's important, is to make it interesting. I, so, will, sure. I will say on that top topic of simulating a utopia, um, if you subscribe to, and again, this is a Rastrian belief, I think you mentioned also earlier that like the creator is not benevolent entity, but like we are kind of trapped in this sort of like limited jail physical space that reality is more than a negative thing we have to overcome. Um, hmm. If you think about things like the creatures from the Matrix, or I forgot who they were, uh, the, the, the thing, the, the, like the, the machines? No, so, yeah, the machines, the machines. The machines. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Sentinels. Just machines. Okay, I, right. or, or sentinels. Uh, this is the sentinels, right? No, all right, never mind. Right. <laughs> yeah. I think we, we know what you're talking about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're on all the right. same page. All right. Um, in my defense, I'm lying. Um, <laughs> all right. I'm happy to hear that. So, <laughs> so, so what I was saying was, um, if you think the entity is negative, then ultimately it is incentivized to jail you and to give you a task that you need to feel like you constantly have to be doing because that way you can't really think about the nature of existence and you can't work on actually doing anything because you're so involved and absorbed and just like surviving and you know. And you're mm. like, girl is trapped you. Yeah, yeah, that's that's true. True. Right. Yeah. So technically then like you would say my role is like a deprogrammer because like my role in somebody's life is to make them feel less anxious and less worried and like their decisions aren't really so impactful that they can live in the day to day and see things positively and awesome. practice gratitude, you know, find their hobbies, whatever. Well, and the foil to that would be if this is simulated reality, the reason reality is kind of shit is because we are at risk and they have to keep us busy. Right. <laughs> and because it come down to free will as without consequences, we would not be leading ourselves to a haven. I actually um, we made our own matrix. I don't know how we, it's not a simulation. I mean, we <laughs> all live in our own reality to begin with, each person. There's that many realities in this room right now. Yeah. I mean, so I don't know. What we created Those are all simulations if ourselves. you think about it. Yeah. yeah. We've got to wrap this up because uh, we're <laughs> running out of time. We can have this conversation no, forever. But so, I, 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 I want to end on um, the idea that maybe, you know, it's not a bad thing to be in a simulation. Like, you know, it's, it could be something that we're trapped in. But what if this is sort of like a video game and we came in here willingly to have, you know, fun as human beings? And that goes along with what you were saying. It might be a simulation, but, you know, if we are in a simulation, the point is to be in the simulation and to enjoy the things that it has to offer. So.
being a programmer is like yeah. exactly how I want it. That's what I want to do. So yeah, yeah, help you program us so that though. we have more power over what we project into the world and make that utopia sweet. I'm really glad that all of you were so uh, engaged in this conversation. I didn't expect such a dialogue. So thanks for coming. And I, if, again, please, if you want to see more stuff, I got you know I'm online, so check it out.